we could float a little longer, proving to our strict parents that we could do anything if they allowed us to take risks. The dog we would race behind the fences, trying to see how fast we could run from strangers, or the apple I, I would pick from my neighbor's yard. One time I ate one, and it tastes like a ball of sugar, all the sweets I needed to run from my father's belt when he would ungird from his on waist. I was a kid then, and I still returned to the same kid those days when I drive down my, de my defaced neighborhood. You can get out our home, but you can never kill our memory, because they will always lead us back home. Uh, okay, so this poem, um, I have a three-year-old. He's very busy. And this is not, this is the poem is not specifically about him, but it's, it is about, like, he always, like, when he sees the moon, he's like, Daddy, moon, 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 like, loves the moon. And I'm sitting here thinking, like, and I, I just, I'm a free thinker, like every artist, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, man, damn, that moon's been up there, like, a long time. <laughs> like, yeah, like generations after generations, like it never dies. It's the same damn moon. So I'm like, I'm gonna write a poem about that moon. And I don't know. So it's not nothing, but it's just something I, I wrote a few days ago. I was depressed at school. I'm like, I'm gonna write a poem because these kids are killing me. Um, really I never thought eight year olds could like totally like abuse and physically for verbally bullying me. I'm like, I've never been bullied before, but when I start teaching, I'm like, I am the victim of bullying. I am the victim. All right, um, so, um, yeah. Grandson, don't let no human convince you that God ain't real. Come here. Take your eyeball and point it towards the moon. He is an old fellow. They say he is four billion years old, older than me. You really think after all those years, he has been standing up there with his Asian knees, all by himself. How come he hasn't fallen over into our front yard yet? Now, I don't doubt he is tired standing up there all this time, but I do believe he is leaning on God. Every night before bed, I come out here on this porch just to look up, look up at all of the moons in mortal glory, and they say nothing lives forever. Ha, the moon fooled them. Look here. Don't let anyone tell you God ain't real. Yay. Um, I have tons, 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 tons of new poems that I'm not going to share anymore. But I'm going to read because um, I have the honor of winning the Grand um, Slam tournament, and it was the best time of my life uh, because I grew up with an IEP in poor reading um, comprehension and poor writing expression. So to come up here and write a poem when like my IEP specifically said I could not write. And I literally, to this day, I have my IEP and I carry it with me in my little, my little notebook thing. I'm like, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so and that kind of was just kind of like the uh, catalyst I need to just keep on going and, um, yeah, and just to be happy. Uh, so this poem, um, it's like a little section. It's entitled Death, Secret, and Soil. It's just like, just me like grappling with death and my, you know, fear of dying and, you know, just, just death in general. And it's just a few short poems that I'm just going to read there. Am I pretty good on time? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So this poem is titled Paper Airplanes. I used to be a social worker, and I remember um, going to visit a client, and um, his daughter, she had uh, cancer, and he talked about how she was dying. I'm like, God, man. You know, um, so I just wrote a poem after that. I got in the car, and I was like, throw it, throw it away. Um, it's entitled Paper Airplanes. From the kitchen, he announced, my baby girl has brain cancer. She was the strongest, the only one smiling during that heartbreaking diagnostic. She even held onto all of her balloons. I noticed his tears flowing silently from the kitchen floor into the living room. His daughter peeked into the kitchen. He picked her up, held her like her childhood teddy bear, ran all five of his fingers across the garden of her hair, and said, I've never been a praying dad, but pray with me. Later that night, we climbed onto the roof. Like paper airplanes, we flung our prayers to God, hoping he would catch them. And this is entitled, Death is Facing um, Your Fears. When I like, was totally thought I was dying from a heart attack. Uh, really, well, I wasn't. And I'm like, I had to let this test me. I'm, like, I'm not going to the doctor's office. Like, I don't have insurance. Like, this is the reason why I'm not going. And I went, because it became unbearable. But I was okay. Just my own fault. 
Um, but, but yeah, stop that. <clears throat> my hands began to shake. I had a tore apart my hospital now. I felt myself running from the tight grip of an emergency room shouting, my sick heart does not belong in this hospital, but death is facing your fears. While waiting, I stared at an empty wheelchair for hours. A minute later, I watched a tearful woman curl her body into a knot. The, the boy across from me tied a rope around himself. He pulled as if he was playing tug of war with his dying body. All the weeping paralyzed me from the ears down. We were all in different pain. When my name was called, the arms of my chair pulled at my gown. When the RN took my blood, my fears began to seep through the needle. Upon being wheeled to my x-ray, I passed by eight blue curtains. One of the curtains was pushed to the side. Inside it lied a feeble man holding his forehead while a sobbing woman could shed a blanket from the veins in his arms. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is titled, um, really short poem. Like, I used to always get freaked out when I see like funeral cars. Um, and I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna write a poem about it. And it's entitled Single Soul, and it's very, very short. A car the color of coal leads mourning vehicles. There is one body, one coffin. Tears leak from the exhaust pipes. Passengers were mortality, passengers wear their mortality made of silver. As they disappear into the fog of the cemetery, I can't help but to wonder, how much life does death swallow? Mm. Um, I was in my feelings when I first found out I had a child in the way. Like, I was so fearful, so joyful, so anxious, so, like, I just felt life. And um, I remember I was just, like, bemoaning about, like, being a dad before. Like, I was bragging, like, I'm graduating from college, I've got kids, you know, I'm, I'm living life. And then, like, you're pregnant, you, you know, you got a child in the way. I'm like, bro, I don't got a job yet. So, I'm like, this is bullshit. Um, so, I, like, flew, I was... I every guy. I took the, any job. I was like, I'm gonna get. I, I'm gonna make some money. Um, Cause my dad took care of me, so I'm, I, I, I owe it to my dad to show him that I can be better than him. Um, so <laughs> this I don't know. Damn day. I was walking alone down the streets of Short North on a damp day, trying to see myself in the wet glass windows and puddles beneath my feet, trying to make sense of all these years of grief. I learned that everyone is busy, too busy like a city that never blinks, trying to find death before death does. I'm learning to slow down like a bicycle, live life at my own pedal. The two stretch roads between a crowd of people and an empty sidewalk lies within me. There are more stories to live, more poems to write, more pain to feel. I was thinking about my son, who was four months away. His name is Levi Demetrius Harris. The other day, his mother said to me, I have been waiting for you to speak to Levi. I wonder if my little man can hear daddy's fears in his, in his mother's womb, hear my hatching joy. I never raised a flower, but I will raise a son. One thing this pregnancy has taught me was to face a little scarecrow within myself. Um, I'm going to do, okay, I'm going to do this poem. And I'm actually doing poems that I really don't like that much, but this is like being great. Because I just got a rejection letter from a, I was submitting some individual poems and like I didn't get accepted for this um, publication, but I'm like, you know what's cool, because I like, I like, re I sent the poem, didn't really revise the poem, when I sent it, I'm like, oh, I, so I'm like, <laughs> them, like, can you fix this, can you do this, can you do this, and they're like, hell no, dude, <laughs> I, I kind of anticipated that rejection letter, so it's all good, um, this is entitled A Barber With Holy Hands, about, I, I get, I used to get my hair cut a lot, because I was insecure, and, um, <laughs> And this bar, we was talking about going to college. I never went to college. I'm like, oh, wow, I want to hear the story. And this is what he told me. I was never that school type of kid. You know that kid who checked his stopwatch to honor the start of class. Or that kid who carried a bookshelf in his back. Imagining the hallways as the only path to a fulfilling life. But my vision was much different. In my briefcase, I carried three brushes, brushes, five combs, and a fresh pair of Andy's hair clippers. I was rewarded a record number of discipline referrals and detention for studying stylist catalogs. During lunch, I will cut hair in bathrooms, stretching from the lunchroom to get the haircuts, not the urine. I never understood what it meant to be studious. Upon graduating from high school, I didn't want to go to college, but I swear barber shops are just like lecture halls. I learn something every day from ordinary people. The hair clippers that dangle from my hands are the only voices that keep telling me, I am something. I cut hair, I cut hair seven days a week. 
I am a simple guy with a counter full of hair products and a pouch of $1 bills. I'll be lucky to ever earn a fortune. Do you know how many people sat in my chair with their heads hung low, only for these steel blades to lift their heads back up again and give them back more of their beauty? Make them see something. The rewarding part is when I hand them the mirror, how it speaks to them. Earlier this week, I cut a young man's hair. He tearfully told me that his heart was broken. He asked me to cut off his dreadlocks so that he could give them to his ex, revealing to her how long they have grown together to only be shaved off with sharp scissors. Wow. I'm not done. You're right. Um, like, like 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm growing dread, by the way. Can't tell. And I don't believe in myself anymore. I'm doing it because I don't get it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this poem is a true story. I remember like I was like back in middle school because I could not spell to save my life. Thank God for spell check. And like I'm writing like a note to a girl. I can say it because I was middle school. That don't count. <laughs> and I'm like writing this love note, and like I know I'm not, I'm not gonna give it to her. I'm just like imagine like what a love, love note. So I'm writing it to her, and I'm looking at her like I'm like, a good love note. But I <laughs> meant to like dispose it, you know, and I like left it there. And I'm walking down the hallway like yeah, I just wrote a cool love note. And then I heard a guy like came out like Cortez, and he opened up the letter in the middle of the hallway, and he's like reading it out loud, but like really taunting me about how I was misspelling every word. So I'm like, that was the most traumatizing day of my life. So I'm like, and I really feel like spell check came out like right after that. So. <laughs> Divine, right? <laughs> um, so it's entitled, um, Spell check. And I used to envy people who was good at spell, like spelling bees. I wish I could spell like you. Um, but it's entitled for spell check. I was never a good speller. I was the kid who would ball into paper, but I had to spell in public. I believe my brain dissolved into ruined ink. Ironically, watching spelling bees was sort of like watching an Olympic torch. I have always enjoyed how words lit up into flames and continued to burn into the clothing of a beautiful speller who was finally put out so that I could finally feel normal, not stupid, but normal. In Highlands Elementary, I wanted to be friends with Joe Kennedy. He was a spelling bee metal. He was our Aquila and the bee. I have always admired the flashcards of correctly spelled words stacked in his mind. To this day, he could never count the band-aids for every bruise I got for not being able to spell. There may have been thousands. The thought of spelling was a nightmare biting his teeth in my school morning. But for Joe, spelling was his name tag, his permission slip. My deepest phobia was leaving my notebook in class because in the sixth grade, a group of bullies turned my notebook into a piano, held it in the air for everyone to see. One boy smashed it with a book. My words burst from the pages. Every student in the hallway picked up my misspelled words and laughed at me. The taunting was way too loud. I imagine any word I ever wrote tearing itself from paper. In that moment, I wish I was Joe, but I was a game of hangman without the body. A distorted crossword puzzle. Every time I dared to write, I could never remember the whisper of vows. After school, I hurried home. I wanted to be a dictionary so bad. I wrote words all over my body with permanent ink. When I returned to school, those regular students with red ink pen eyes would not stop staring at me. Mm. Um, and this one is like about my mom. She was so she to this day she really thinks she's gonna hit the mega millions. And like she plays, she my mom has like six kids. She plays all her birthdays as numbers, and she's still to this day like we are going to be rich, and I'm gonna hit. And I'm like, mom, like give it up right now. Like you're not gonna win. You're probably winning ten dollars, but that can't do anything. But um, but honestly, all jokes aside, my mom, you know, she, you know, um, doesn't make that much money, and it was almost like, I don't know, like she would talk about these things, and it made her feel good that like someday I'll buy the things I want to buy for you. And honest, unfortunately, when a lottery is like, it just seems like it's my only hope, the only chance at doing that. So it's entitled "When the Lottery Is Your Last Hope." I read that the chance of winning a lottery is roughly the same chance of getting hit by lightning on your birthday. True fact. When I was a baby boy, my mom was a million dollar storyteller. She, story she told stories of what she would buy for me and my siblings when she won mega millions. As we listened with sheer excitement, we grew elephant ears and flapped around our empty apartment. She told us things like, when I strike for millions, I will buy us new toothbrushes, dressers, a working lamp, socks, kitchen table, a dryer so we can finally cut down that damn clothing line. Each of us will have bed frames in our rooms. All of us were shot with joy. 
We were louder than a TV static buzzing from the living room. Every time I caught my mom weeping, because she needed money to stop the bathtub from crying ice water, I forced my imagination to run like kites along the wind. I imagined building a bending lottery machine just for her. I would tell her, Mom, it is okay. Look what I built for you. Every lottery ticket is a winner just for you. She would smile at me, say nothing. I learned early on that poverty ate away her voice. My imagination would not fly anymore. Her fate is built on lottery machines and tickets, each one bearing a possible dream she believed she would hit if she played all of her children's birthdays as numbers. She didn't want to let us down. Every night before bed, I could hear the scratching of lottery tickets. I would save all of the pennies I found from walking to and from school for months, give them to my mom, tell her, look at your fingers. You don't have to scratch anymore. How many poems? Uh, about five minutes. Um, so this poem, I mean, this book is entitled Nothing Scan. The overarching theme is um, really trying to, as an African-American male, really trying to um, counteract the negative, often portrayals of um, black men, and just kind of like just sharing a new narrative. And so a lot of the, there's like a common theme of, you know, talking about um, the plight of black males. And this poem, specific, I'm going to do two. Um, it's entitled, um, Call Me Home. Um, and like this. <clears throat> Call me housing projects. Everywhere I go, I look like a suspect. Call me dead existing. I exist to die. Call my gun wounded death a natural cost. Call me Trayvon Martin's dead son or his dead grandson. Call me criminal injustice. Don't call me justice. The national crime against black boys are knocked on billboards. Call black boy funeral home and orphanage. Call me prison mattress. Call me fatalism. There are no evacuation rules in the projects. Call me black placenta. Call me post-slavery. I think slavery repeats history. Call me a slave to an invisible system. Call me a white dollar bill. Wish my ancestors had money, never saw money, never felt money. Call me home. I wish our parents would call us home. It's too black. The streetlights don't come on. They forgot about us. They think we are dead already. The light can no longer save us. Call me church building. Call my church a church that is a welcome sinners. Call me a sinner from birth. I'm afraid of death because I would die a sinner. Bloody Jesus, please call my casket home. Call me love, then call me hell. Call me black, then call me something. I'm going to do one more. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do talk um, very modestly about having a learning disability. And um, this was, like, actually, like, the first poem I ever really liked. Ever really liked. And um, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to travel a lot in college. I represent Ohio State University at Cup City, so it's a college union poetry summer invitation. So we traveled. First, we went to University of Michigan, which was so interesting. Go Bucks, she's from Michigan. I play with her a lot. And then we went to uh, Laverne. Not Laverne, but we went somewhere in California, and we just bombed, we bombed, we bombed. We was in any even place. And then we went to my last year before I graduated. We, went, we competed in New York, and it's like all um, Ivy League school, all Big Ten schools, and whatnot. And it was fortunate because I was a party from college, but I was able to be on that team, and we actually like ranked 15 out of 80 colleges. So I'm like, oh, and I performed this poem, and I'm like, I'm like, I think this guy's good. Um, <laughs> no, I know I had some, there was some amazing counterparts I was working with, but this poem was entitled Imperfect Brain, and um, yeah, so it's about like the stigma associated with having an IP or a uh, learning deficit. Okay. Um, according to an assessment, my mind is empty of query. I am forced to sit in a special classroom where every wooden bookshelf is a reminder that I've never escaped the fourth grade. Insults drip from the holes in the ceiling. This carpet is soaked with insecurities. Empty day pencils are scattered everywhere. The deceased sharpener tilts on the chip wall. The bulletin board tears off at normal lesson plan. It is tired of being ridiculed by the whispers crawling beneath the doormat. The defigured words on the blackboard spells brainless. The chalk powder is poisoned in my brain cells. I am convinced that my imagination is below grade level. The rupture needs buckling under the doormats. There is caution tape wrapped around this classroom. Every regular student glares through the tiny windows. They see nothing but corpse gasping for wisdom. I hear college don't have classes like these. I have developed frightening routines. I jump out of my desk. 
I run to the back of class and I take cover. I don't want anyone to see me in this room infested with misspelled words. When anyone asks, what is your favorite classroom? I smile an eerie burden. I tell them fire drills, tornado warnings. That is the only time I feel normal. When the alarms are blaring, the chalkboard crumbles into dust. The nails on my desk loosens. It falls apart. I entangle the embarrassment in my fists. I pick up all of my broken pencils. I carry them with me. While they're dying, my carcass feels alive with pride. Bleeding from my left shoulders, I walk with my peers. I am not a wheelchair. These hallways do not separate us by the diagram of our brains. We are all enclosed in the same cranium. My imagination is a sand castle. The cells in my mind are above grade level. This is what college must look like. My brain and spinal cord never felt disconnected. When I pass our library, my confidence becomes hardback books. These normal classrooms is where I belong. Now we all take cover. I don't need a referral to be here. When the alarm stops, attendance is taken. My teacher reads off four names. A piercing voice behind me reads off 20. I don't want to be here. We are asked to get up from our knees. Head to class. The drill is over. I don't want to move. Stigma cripples the activity in my bone block. Staggered to my cage, I pass normal classroom. Door slams. It locks. Light bulb shatters. Red steaming eyes come peeling through the darkness. The insects of my insecurities come crawling out of my pockets, up my arms, across my shoulders, and around my neck, my perfect friend. Our single file line looks like a snake. Everyone is staring with nets in their eyes. I go, uh, YouTube was amazing. I'm, I, I promise you. I'm, when I was writing, I'm like, right now, what you were saying, amazing, moved me. I would have cried, but she's there. She's like, no, I cried. But no, thank you a lot. <laughs>